Mr. President. <laughs> I'm honored and delighted to be here. I love coming back to visit. Uh, Harvard Tate Monsieur is one of my dear friends and I have dinner with her maybe once, uh, once a, a month and we talk about her practice which is booming and growing and just this is a great representative and a great alumni for, for, your, for your college. Let me see if I can pull this. Oh wait, am I doing it right away? There it is. This is my usual spiel, but, but what I wanted to do, like I wanted it to apply to what you're going through in your life. I mean, you're in your second year. This is where you're inundated with data, you're trying to get to your classes, trying to learn as much as possible before the fun begins in your third and fourth year. So, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and what you're going through is just a part of this journey. This is your journey in life. And so I'm going to share with you my journey in medicine with the hope that something in this journey strikes you as relevant. You're going to say, as, as my kids used to tell me when they were in high school, I would tell them something and they'd look at me, you know, typical high school kids, and go, Mom, this means what to me, right? <laughs> How is this relevant? So my goals are threefold. Three, four. Number one, share a journey, because everybody likes stories. And if you're diagnosing a patient, what is a 99% of the diagnosis is the history. How, what's the history? What do you get from the history? You can figure out what's the pattern. What's the history? What's my life journey? What did I learn from that? You know, you can go through suffering, you can go through challenges, but what good is it unless you can learn something and impart it to somebody else so that they don't make the same mistakes, that they can learn from that. And in the end, I call it the wow, the words of wisdom. What did I learn as a physician, a woman, a business owner, a former military officer, uh, a mother, a wife, a widow, how can I share that? And how can that touch you personally? Not only professionally, but also personally. So I begin with, my belief that is the journey that defines us, that when you're born, you've got a path to follow, right? And you become the person you are because of all the people you inter interact with. But as we say at ADH, the waypoints, the places you fly through in your life, the lives you touch, the people who impact you, you become that person. I was not born as a White House doctor. I was born in the Philippines, okay? I didn't speak English when I was a little girl. This photograph, I'm the second little girl from the left. This one, I was two years old. This is in a province of Pampanga, Philippines, two hours north of Manila. This woman is my maternal grandmother. These are her grandkids, these are my cousins. And it's very humble. Uh, my grandmother uh, lost her brothers, her brother, sister, grandfather in the, in the plume pan pandemic of the early 1900s left her and her mother alone, and they sold fish in the market. And when she was 17, she met a young man in the town. It was actually a baseball game. He made a home run, and she was called upon to pin a little ribbon on his shirt, and that was my grandfather. And so they got married within a month, and he was fairly well off. And then they had seven kids. My mother was the oldest of the seven. So I was the oldest of my mother's kids. And here are my cousins. And this is a few months before I moved to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii with my dad and my mom. My dad was Navy. So I look at this picture, and it, it's one of these photos late at night, you're watching TV, and it's like, oh my gosh, that's that care package photo with the black and white print, the kids in the third world country. And you're like, oh my gosh, care package, I need to get the check out, I need to donate money to these poor little kids in the third world country. And I think of, it's okay to start humble, because you, you look at where you start. And there's, there's a thing about, you know, always wanting to fit in, but when you start humble, it makes you want to strive, right? I don't want to be a victim, I'm going to try hard, I'm going to succeed, I'm going to have to take advantage of my opportunities, because I never want to be poor again. This I remember, I don't remember growing up in the Philippines, I remember my fifth birthday in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, this is the military base, my dad was stationed there, this was in the 60s. And in those days, mom made the birthday cake, uh, you got in with your little friends, you got dressed up in the pink frilly dresses, I was there. And I think when I see this photograph, it's a theme of always trying to fit in, and that was a struggle all my life. When you walk into a situation and you're the only one of your color, your gender, your ethnic background, last name, whatever, that you're different. And I was always struggling with just never fitting in. Here I am trying to fit in with the neighborhood kids, again, wearing the obligatory pink frilly dress. I think the one who's having the hardest problem is my little brother. <laughs> not fitting in, and it continued until his adulthood, still not fitting in. So one of the stories I share is going from underdog to top dog, always trying to fit in, 
And, and I reconciled not fitting in really later in life when I realized it's not so bad when you stand out, right? And when you're in your room and there are a bunch of MDs and you're an ND, that's okay. Don't feel bad about that, right? Because when you have an opportunity where you stand out from the group, that's your chance to be outstanding. Just look at those words. Stand out, outstanding. Because you stand out in a good way. That's your time to make your point, to tell them what you're about. Because you're not boring. You're like, you're different from everybody. That's a good thing. That's a chance for you to say, okay, let me tell you what I do. Let me educate you. That keeps you separate. That keeps you special. The other thing is, somebody asked me, what was your secret to success? And I said, well, it's a, it's a sad story because I grew up in a home where the mantra for my parents is, you're never good enough. And so in a lot of ways, it made you try harder, saying, no, no, no I'm going to show you. I'm going to defy that. So how do you define never good enough? It's really keep trying. Keep trying to the point where you think you're good enough. So as a Asian American girl in California back in the 70s, this is my commencement picture. I was valedictorian of my high school class. I was secretary of the ASB as associate student body. I was editor chief of the school paper, we took a local achiever, commencement speaker. And the humbling part of that was that it's in the 70s and my two sons would say, Mom, what's the big deal? That was the 70s, Southern California. We all know that half your class was still in your drunk bag. <laughs> <laughs> I was a good Catholic girl. I never inhaled. I went to my way And I uh, got scholarships, worked hard, uh, went to UC San Diego, got my bachelor's, and then applied to medic medical school. Now, why did I want to go into medicine? I had a lot of career options growing up. Uh, I think the first career I wanted to investigate as a little girl was I wanted to be a nun. And I realized, well, you wear the same old thing and then you can't date guys, so it's not that you a nun. <laughs> I be a teacher. And I thought, you know, a teacher's good. But then what really changed me was my parents were stationed in Taipei, Taiwan. And I went to a military medical, I went to a uh, department of defense school. And one morning, they had career day, and they had one of the physicians from the Navy hospital, who was an OBGYN doctor, and he sat there talking to his seventh graders about what it was like delivering babies. And I was amazed. I just looked on his face about delivering children, taking care of patients. And so I came home that day and I announced to my mother that I wanted to become a physician. And they were shocked because they couldn't afford to send me to med school. They thought they tried to, they tried to sort of smooth that over and said, no, don't you want to be a secretary? No, you can be a typewriter, and you can type civil service and again never good enough so I said no I think I want to go into medicine and part of that is people say no but you say in the mind of minds I'm going to do that I'm going to pursue I'm not going to take no for an answer I got into medical school I got into the military medical school in Bethesda because my parents could not afford to send me to the other medical schools and I didn't want to have debt and the beauty of that school USUHS at that time I was the second class to matric matriculate was it was a full scholarship you are active duty military, you get active duty pay, and, and uh, you pay them for that, you are on active duty 10 years after you graduate. So they pretty much have you, but that was what I wanted to do. So what did I learn from four years in med school that I can help you now with? Just be a sponge, right? Just, you know, you may come in one point and say, okay, I'm just gonna be, I'm gonna do this particular thing, especially, but when you come in, just be open. The word is open. Be a sponge. Grab whatever you can, but really be open for all the information coming at you. Learn from every specialty, every modality. If you want to subspecialize, you can tell what field you're going to go to, what particular part of medicine, naturopath you want to do, because there'll be something you get excited about. That particular class, you, you can't stop talking about. You know, is it, is it acupuncture? Is it uh, manipulation? Is it chiropractic? Is it, is it about the supplements? What is it that you get excited about? Ask yourself, you'll know. You'll know what you get excited about when you do your clinical rotation. Imagine yourself practicing. What does your practice look like? Envision that about that. Dream about it. What does that look like for you? And then take care of yourself, right? You know, pretend you're one of your patients. How would you take care of yourself? Nutrition, you've got nutritious food, your sleep, your exercise, your mental health. It's so important, all those things. You'll see it in the real life with your own patients. We've got to, you know, doctor heal thyself, right? You know, when you go see a doctor, and that's the thing, you are the poster child for what your patients if, if you're struggling with weight, with any addiction, with alcohol, cigarettes, you're not a good role model. Your patients look to you to be the role model. So 
you're that role model. I spent 24 years active duty in the Navy. I didn't have a plan to spend 24 years active duty in the Navy. It just happened that way. I, and I'll tell you about that. The recruiting ads are true. It's not just a job. It's an adventure because not only are you a physician, as I went in, but you're, you have to learn to lead because you have departments of people who, who work under you, so to speak. Be all you can be, absolutely. You know, we give you absolutely lots of opportunities and learning leadership. Let me share your leadership roles that are important because, you know, why does this mean anything to you? I think whenever you work in any organization, you look at your leadership skills. If you want things done, even in your own practice, what are my leadership skills? How can I, how can I make what I want happen? How can that happen to other people? Because it's hard to practice medicine in a vacuum. You can sit there and see people, but that unless I work with pharmaceuticals or pharmacy, unless I can order studies, I'm isolated. I rely on other people to carry out your plan for your patients. Number one thing the military and General Fridovich will say is the mission comes first. What is my mission? Now I actually apply this to business. What is the purpose of your practice, your business? What is the purpose of your life? What is my life's mission? What's my life calling? The second is there's a chain of command in the military, right? You've got the president, the vice president, you've got the people in the troops, the department. In any business, you've got personal practice. They head of the hospital, they head of the clinic. If you want your own practice, you run it. But who are the people who work with you, right? Your ancillary staff, your medical assistants, your receptionists. My philosophy is we work together. I never say somebody worked under me, they worked with me. You're only as good as the person who answers your phone in the clinic, right? You could be the best naturopath in the world, but if your front desk people are polite and nice and kind, <laughs> they reflect on you. That's all about you. Take care of your troops. Once again, be good to the people around you because they reflect you. And they'll they'll be loyal to you. They'll look out for you. They'll look out for your patients. A happy clinic has happy staff. They project that. Your patients can tell how happy you are. It's how you do that. And they look at you. Your energy projects them. But take care of every single one around you. Don't burn your bridges. This is a small world. It's even smaller if you're not a nice person. I know more about naturopathic medicine through Arvita Nasir, who's a friend of mine. You know, don't burn those bridges, and then she'll introduce me to different people. I know Daniel Rubin, I know Debbie Smolinski, and I refer patients back and forth. Don't burn those bridges. Somebody in your class you may decide to be a partner with, you may decide to marry. Who knows, right? Somebody here you're going to connect with. And I always believe there's a reason here with certain people in your life that why am I meant to sit with this person today? Why am I meant to be at this event to meet that person? So think of it, don't burn your bridges, but every contact, what is the purpose? What am I gaining? The final thing, really about my lessons from the military is serve a higher purpose. Serve something bigger than you, right? You don't go into medicine really to make a lot of money. If you wanted to do that, don't do that. That's not a reason to work. You don't feel paid for your therapy if you think that's the purpose. <laughs> bigger and greater than you. Make it a higher purpose. How did I wind up at the White House? I never planned to be there. I had visited the White House through the kitchen back in the 1960s when my dad was stationed in Washington, D.C. Had a cousin under Kennedy, and he <coughs> went to tour the White House when we came through the kitchen, because they were stewards back then. So my story of the White House begins in 1991. I lived in San Diego at the time. I was in the Navy. I was married to my first husband, which is a whole different story. Uh, our, our sons were one and three. We lived in a nice house, three doors down from my mom and dad in Pearl Beach, California. I was at the Navy Hospital San Diego, and I was division head for internal medicine, so I was part of this training program. So during the day, I'd see patients in clinic, and the afternoon would come, and I would round in the wards as attending, and then go home about six or seven at night, have dinner ready, or my mom would help me with dinner with the kids, put them to bed. And we didn't have emails in those days, so I'd read, do something else, go to bed, and then start all over again, 5 o'clock the next morning, and over and over. And at that time, I thought, you know, is this really what I want to do the rest of my life, work in clinic? Is that, is that it? I mean, is there more? And there might come a time in your career, you might say, is this really what I want to do the rest of my life, right? God willing, you're going to live in your 80s, 90s, you're going to be active, healthy, keep your mind sharp. What do you really want to do? Most people 
have 27 different jobs in their career. They say for millennials, about 27, 30 different jobs. You're not going to work for the same company the rest of your life. You know, you're going to do different things. And wear many hats. So I was wrestling at that time. Do I want to stay in the Navy? Do I want to do something else? Do I want to get a private practice? And at that time, my 10-year commitment to the military was almost over. And I had to decide whether I wanted to stay in the Navy or get out. And I was really struggling with that. My husband said, listen, my law firm is going to Palm Springs this weekend for a retreat with the spouses. Why don't we go, leave the kids with your parents, and then we'll go to Palm Springs and maybe decide that. And so, OK, let's do that. So we left the kids with mom and dad. We drive out to the desert, we're in Palm Springs. I remember getting the first massage of my life. It was amazing. <laughs> Our touch it was wonderful. So I got a massage. That afternoon, we went down into the Grand Ballroom for dinner. I go down to Baldwin with my husband, and he goes off to talk to the attorneys. And they're a bunch of, they're all men back then, and I go find the wives, and I find them in the corner. <coughs> I look over at the, the wives of the law term, the uh, law, law partners. And the partners' wives, what struck me was they were all rested, they were tan, they had dust on their clothes, they talked about Pilates and yoga, they weren't stressed out and burnt out like I was. <laughs> I just said, oh my gosh, look at them. They look wonderful. So I went to my husband and said, you know, I, I've had an epiphany. I think I know what I want to do next. What do you want to do? I will get out of the Navy because my time is up. You make law partner and I can become a trophy wife. <laughs> and he said, okay, okay, let's do that. So we got to make law partner so we can afford that. So we have a nice weekend. We go back to San Diego that Sunday, Monday morning. I go to the Navy base. I go to the Office of Personnel because you can't just say, I quit, I'm done. You've got to go to the Office of Personnel. They give you paperwork back in those days. You fill it in triplicate. They send it to Washington, D.C. They make a decision, and nine months later, they say, you are now released from active duty to the civilian world. So I have the paperwork on my desk. I'm filling it out. And it really... You know, it gets home that I am divorcing the military. I've been in the military all my life. My dad was in the Navy for 30 years. I went to the military medical school. I had already served 10 years. And I was going to say goodbye. And so that's what it takes. So I'm filling it out. And as I'm filling it out, my phone rings. And it, it's my boss, Captain Midas, the, I say the Midas touch, the chairman of medicine. And he doesn't know I'm trying to leave. And he always says, Connie, I received the message traffic, traffic, they call it message traffic, it's like a telegram, from Washington, D.C., and I'm to nominate five candidates for the position of White House doctor to represent the Navy, and I'd like to include you among the five nominees. And I said, I've never heard of that position. He goes, well, not many people know. There's an Army doctor, an Air Force doctor, and a Navy doctor. There's a medical team at the White House since the 1920s. It's a two-year assignment. You're still in the Navy, you wear civilian clothing, you get to follow the president around, you're on Air Force One, Marine One, take care of the president, the first family, there's a clinic up there, it's a whole deal. And it's a great honor, you're still active duty, and at the end of your two-year assignment, we can send you anywhere. You can even come back here to the Navy hospital, or you can go run a clinic, however you want. You're still part of us. I said, my gosh, so I, I had to live in Washington, right? So yeah, Virginia or Maryland, you've got to get close to the White House. So I said, you know, let, let me call my husband, because you got to, you know, I want to buy a partner. So I hang up, call my husband at his law firm, tell him about this change of plans potentially. The first thing out of his mouth is, are you nuts? <laughs> you hate Washington, D.C. You, you grew up there in the 60s. You know very well it's hot and humid in the summer. It's cold and miserable in the winter. But most important of all, they don't have good Mexican food like they do. <laughs> Although, he says good Mexican food. And he says, of course you're going to get out. You're going to be a trophy wife, right? I said, yeah. You're right. Let, let me tell him no. So I hang up and get ready to call my boss. And I look over, and in those days you had this little tiny little box thing. It's a pager, and it just has a, a little little message there that says "call me" or whatever. It's a number. So it's vibrating. It's like, oh, it's my husband trying to call me. So I hang up the phone. I call him back. I said, well, I was getting ready to call my boss. He says, it struck me that go ahead and apply, okay? Because it's okay to apply, because you know you will never get this job anyway, right? Never get this. So let me sidebar. Two important lessons from that comment. You'll never get this job anyway. The two most important decisions in your life. Number one, your mission. What's your mission? What are you meant to do? The second, your life's partner, okay? You make sure your life's partner is your biggest fan. 
right? Who believes in you. So that was the first husband. That's the one I said. I do most <laughs> so as he said, you'll never get this job anyway, but it's a good resume item in case you decide to apply for Kaiser, right? Okay, thanks. So I hang up, I tell my boss, go ahead and put my name in, I'll, I'll, I'll apply. So fast forward, nine months later, I'm in Washington, D.C., it's Christmas time, they're decorating the White House, it's beautiful. I'm walking around with these four other guys, we're in full military uniform, it's navy blue. And I'm looking at my competition, I'm sizing them up, and they, they all have, you know, they're all Naval Academy, Surface Warfare, SEAL Team, you know, Flight Surgeon Medals, nice hair, nice teeth. They look like Tom Cruise from that movie. Right? And one of the guys is so confident he's going to get the job because he's supposed to be the best man at the wedding of the guy we're replacing. I was like, oh, it's who you know. I didn't know anybody watching. I knew nobody. So they're walking around, and part of the interview process is you get interviewed by security, because you have to have a top secret security clearance to even get close to what you're going to do. The second is they get interviewed by members of the medical unit, because there's a whole team. And the third interview for each of us individually is with the senior physician at the White House at the time, who was J. Burton Lee III. Now, this was before Al Gore invented the internet, so I could not do an internet search. But at that time, back in the 1990s, I did a library search on J. Berkeley III, because one of the things, if you're going to be interviewed by somebody, okay, teaching point, go research who that person is. Find out where they went to school, what they're about, what their hobbies are, Google them, okay? Find everything so that when you meet that person, you're trying to find something you have in common. You know, if they hate cats, don't tell me you have a cat. <laughs> you know, if they have something in common, because you want to figure out how you can connect so they like you the more you have in common, hopefully. So I researched Dr. J. Burtley III looking for something we had in common. We had nothing in common, right? He, he was one of the New England blue bloods. He went to Andover with George Herbert Walker Bush. He was one of the few people at the White House who could call George and Barbara by their first name. You never have called them, but you called them Mr. President, you know, First Lady, you know, you don't you never call them by their first name, or sir, ma'am. And he had a home in Martha's Vineyard. I mean, on and on. There's like nothing. The only Filipinos he knew were the guys in the White House mess where my people came from, right? He knew the guys who served you in the mess. So I get marched into the ground floor of the White House by the incumbent physician, Dr. Roberts, who's been ready to you know, leave his job for one of us. And he says, Connie, come on in. Uh, have a seat. I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Lee. Goes up to the doorway, and I can see his back into this antechamber of this room. And I can hear him say to somebody, I have our next candidate here. And there's a male voice on the other end that says, well, did you bring her binder with her resume? And Dr. Roberts goes, oh my gosh, I forgot it in the other building. A few seconds later, it's like a boat or a brick being thrown against the wall, this big thud, and the voice goes really gruff. Well, never mind, I'll make the decision without it. And Dr. Roberts pulls away from the door, he looks at me, he goes, you're on. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, you just upset the person I have to interview with. So, <laughs> so I stood up, took a deep breath, this is, before Amy Cuddy wrote her book, Power Posing, but you know, <laughs> don't lose your body, you right, you stand up, you know. What I do before I speak, I usually go in the ladies room, I hide behind the stall in my power pose. For you so you pose, you know, put wipe your sweat off your hands, and you psych yourself up. I walk through the doorway, I go in, and I walk into the room. But before I did that, as I paused, I took a deep breath, and I did something I believe in. And what that is, was the power of prayer. I said, Dear God, if this is meant to be, show me a sign. That's all. Just show me a sign. So I walked through the doorway, walked into the office, and there's Dr. Lee standing there waiting for me. And as soon as I saw him, I saw the sign right away. And it struck me. It's like, oh my gosh, there it is. And what it was, was a single tan banding right across his forehead. I went, oh my gosh. As a mom, my kids were one and three. All I can think of was, he's got a boo-boo on his forehead. He had therapy. You know, that time, he had back ten on his forehead or something. So I look at it and I go, well, I guess the sign is he's human. Don't be afraid, right? He's human. It's like that. So I walk over slowly. I'm thinking, man, he doesn't even warm up. This guy doesn't believe in foreplay, right? So he sits down. I wait for him to sit down. He sits opposite. And he launches into my interview. First question. Why do you want this job? And you've been all that asked. Why do you want to come to medical school? Why do you want to come to this medical school? 
why do you want to join our practice? You will be all asked those questions. Why do you want to be a part of us? So I prepared all these nice responses I thought he would like to hear. But you know, because I saw the sign and don't be afraid, and I'm not going to get this job anywhere. Anyway, what I said was this, Dr. Lee, it's payback time. So he looks at me like, what? Like, what? I said, it's payback time. I said, I owe a lot to the United States of America. My father was a poor man when he joined the US Navy in the 1940s. I came to this country, I was educated in public school. I went to the military medical school. They taught me to be a physician. I trained here. I, I owe everything I have to this country. And if I can repay my debt by serving the commander in chief, that's what I want to do. So I look at Dr. Lee, and there's no expression on his face. He has a as we say in medicine, a flat affect, right? Flat affect, <laughs> or Vegas poker face, right? No comment. Just, so a few seconds later, he goes, what can you do here? So at that time, I was a commander. I said, you see the three gold stripes on my sleeve, Dr. Lee? The longer I'm in the Navy, the more stripes they put on my sleeve, the more they put me behind a desk. I am not a desk doctor, I'm a trench doctor. You put me anywhere in the field outside of a medical center, I can take care of patients, I know what to do. Once again, Flat out there, right? <laughs> Not making points with this guy. Just looking at me like, just staring at me. Really, just unnerving, right? He's just staring at me. So a few seconds later, he stands up right in the middle of my interview. So I stood up. He says, as far as I'm concerned, we can stop the process right now. And so, oh, my heart sinks. I said, totally blew this interview. This is the worst interview of my life. He said, I don't care if we're interviewing today or tomorrow. You've got the job. I'm going to tell Barbara Bush. He shakes my hand, he walks out the door, across the hallway, takes the elevator to the second floor to tell the first lady. I follow him out, I'm looking at him, he's walking away to, to tell the first lady. Dr. Roberts and his assistant are sitting there looking at their watch, and like, that was really fast, like, what happened? And he said, I, I think I got the job. <laughs> and then, a year and a half later, I had his job. So, that was an act of God. But the story, I, I share this because it is a true story. But I think the lessons are several. Ask for help, a divine intervention, yes, it's okay to pray. Prayer is a good thing. But also, speak with your true authentic voice, right? I didn't tell him what I thought he wanted to hear. I told him what I needed to say. So you will be asked a lot of times, people want you to behave a certain way. Don't do that. Be your true authentic self. Nobody can be you better than you. And you'll be challenged that as a, as a healer, as a provider, as a physician. They'll want you to act like somebody else, say for some stereotype. You just be you. That's what people want. And how do you know it's your true authentic self? You're not pretending. Easy. Just be you. It's the easiest thing. If you, someone had to cast you in a movie, who, who's going to play you other than you, right? So that. So it's an answer to prayer. The other is payback. Serve something higher than you. Right? Something greater, something bigger. It wasn't like, oh, I want to fly in Air Force One a lot. I want to make a lot of money. No, no. I want to pay back. And that's the gratitude. What is it like taking care of the first patient, the President of the United States? It is one of the most humbling things. Because, you know, doctors have a waiting room. The patients are sitting there. For the President of the United States, they helicopter to what's now Walter Reed Army Medical Center. They bring you up to a private suite that's bulletproof. And the President comes in, because you usually escort him. And in the waiting room, my doctor's waiting to see him. So, you know, they bring him in, they do his vitals, you go and you grab the cardiologist, the GI, one by one, you're, they're brought in. So it's a very humbling experience. It's one of the few times the secretary calls you and says, doctor, the president will see you, right? So you're there to serve. What do they value in physicians? When I first met George Herbert Walker Bush, the first patient I took care of, he said to one of his nurses, because one of the nurses said he was excited to meet you, because I met him on the third day I was there. And the nurse said, oh, he can't wait to meet you. He was excited to meet you. And I'm like, well, what did he, he, he was asking about me. I go, what, what was he asking? Like, would I, where I trained, board certification, if I published? She goes, no, 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 no. All he wanted to know is if you're athletic, if you had a sense of humor. That's all. <laughs> I had a patient of mine who used to work for Gallup Poll, and I asked him one time, what do patients seek in their physicians, in their healers? What do they look for? Number one thing is kindness. Number two thing is patience, right? You're kind, you're patient. Number three is attentiveness. Things that are in a good dog, right? <laughs> <laughs> that you have time to do. That you are there. You're not 
looking at your computer, look at that. You are physically, you are, you've got them. You make that eye contact. I think one of the things I learned from Clinton, watching him, the power, people call it charisma. It's the ability to make every person you see feel important because you're making that contact. That is a gift. That's something you should perfect as healers. Every patient you see, put down everything. You, you are just looking right there. Because a lot of your gifts of observation, you're looking at something, you can tell their color is off, you can tell if they have a twitch, you can tell if they're asymmetric in a little lot of ways. A lot of things you'll pick up, you can sense their energy. I call it their energy. When you see somebody, there's some patients that after you're with them, you just are exhausted. You're just like, oh, you have energy vampires? They're like, oh my gosh, they just feel horrible. You need to put amethyst around yourself. There are other patients that are just love you. just love them. Those are patients, that, that's when I married them, among my patients. So, you just gotta, you've got to, you've got to commit. You've got to really focus on that person. You're studying them. But when you connect, you make them feel like they are the most important person there. Because that's therapeutic. The fact that you can make that person feel so important that they're a VIP, that's huge. That's, that's the biggest infusion of all. You know, that's the other complimentary medicine. How are you? You look great. Come on in. I'm so glad you're here. That's huge. I mean, why do you think politicians make millions of dollars for donations, right? More than what you get in office visit. How are you? It's great to have you here. You know, come on. They've got it made, right? It's how you treat people. They've got, they've got it made. Taking care of the president, George Herbert Walker Bush, the same age as my dad. I'm just showing that picture where we're running in Kentucky. On a, on a, in, a lot of people didn't know he used to run. That perimeter around him is called the kill zone, not the cal zone, the kill zone. Um, <laughs> when the president travels, uh, they call it the secure package. The, uh, the, the guy up here is Bruce Bowen, who's a secret service agent. Secret service agent on the right, right here, Metro Dade. He's got a radio, he's a senior agent. This is the military aide from a Marine Corps general. Uh, he went on to the Pentagon. This is Debbie, my nurse. And we're following him, this is the kill zone. Uh, after this, I told my staff, do not run with him because if he gets shot, you're in the kill zone. You, you cannot treat him if you're dead. So there are lots of lessons we learn. You take care of the first family. Every one of your patients has family. They have a Jerry Ford's like, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> What's amazing is, is, is uh, Jimmy Carter's 95. You know, he had aneurysm, he had, had um, brain cancer, he's fallen, he's broken a hip. He's still kicking, he's still doing well. So the next book that I'm writing is on longevity. What did we learn from American presidents? They live longer. Now, why, why is that? So there, that's something I'll explore. But you take care of families. Every patient who comes in, there's a family member attached. A quick vignette about families. Somebody said to me, what if you tell the president, you give him advice, and he doesn't want to do what you want him to do? I said, you appeal to higher authority. You know, Mr. President, you don't do this. I'm going to break hip and tell the first lady. <laughs> <laughs> what do I learn from the White House? I love this house. Um, do you ever watch House? Do you ever watch House? You can't do that now. You can't be sexual harassment everywhere. You know, he can't have his license taken away. He was bright, but he was mean. You don't want to be mean. You know, and, and uh, just an aside, you can be the smartest person, smartest person out there, best clinician, smartest person, but if you're not nice to people, you will be sued, okay? Why do people sue you? Because you're, you're mean to them. You diss them, right? You can be not so great, but the nicest person, they won't sue you because they love you. You can admit you made a mistake, you're humble about it, they won't sue you because they love you, right? But going back, what did, what did I learn from the White House? And what can you learn about when you get into practice from other doctors that you meet? Learn what not to do, okay? Learn from people before you, like learn their lesson, your, your attendings, any good teacher will say, well, this is what you can do right, and this is where I messed up. This is where I missed a diagnosis. My gosh, you know, don't, you know, and that's a red flag, so don't, don't make those mistakes, right? Learn from the people before you. If a certain thing didn't work, don't repeat it. That doesn't work. So learn from people around. You're always learning from different modalities, what works and what doesn't work. Listen to unexpected sources. When the White House transitions from one president administration to the other, there's not a lot of continuity. Because one, you know, one day you got Republicans, they got Democrats, it moves back and forth. And even in the military, you, you move on, you get transferred, you moved around. So who stays the longest? Your butlers, your cooks, your florists. They've been there 30 years. The butlers are there for their whole life. 
So when we moved from one administration to the other, I went to one of the cleaning ladies who was working on our office, and I said, what do you, what do, you do with the new president? When you get a new president, new family. And she just laughs and said, honey, you just take care of whoever, whoever lives in this house, right? You don't judge them, you just take care of people. And that's what you do, you just take care of people, right? Just take care of whoever you're, who lives in front of you. If you want to make change happen, and this is what you're doing, right? In terms of medicine, your way, the, the naturopathic way, don't always readily accept we've always done it this way. We've always, because question that. Things in an allopathic medicine, we say, oh, this is just the way it is, right? No, it isn't. It changes. It changes over time. You know, with research and technology and new theories, you know, what I'm practicing today will be totally different 10 years from now, five years from now, new discoveries, right? So when somebody says, well, we've always done it this way, your question is, really, has it worked? <laughs> Tell me how's that worked. The other thing I really believe in that I've learned is, if you can aim to make every person better and every organization better that you touch, it would be a better world. So that could be a great mission statement. If everyone I touch is better as a result of our interaction, I would have done a good job in this life. So that was nine years at the White House. I was uh, promoted to Rear Admiral. And then the Navy was saying, you want to stay longer for George W. Bush, you know, got a few years. And I said, you know, it came a time where your own family talks to you. And my children were 12 and 14 around that time. They'd spent nine years living in D.C. with me and my husband. And what finally changed my decision to leave the White House was it was one afternoon. I was down in the basement of our house in Virginia, and I was going through some things in the basement. And I ran, around, I ran into a journal that my youngest son had written an entry in in his school, and he was probably around seven or eight. I opened the journal, and it was really cool. He had written about his adventures that summer, and I turned the page, and there was one entry that was in the fall, and he wrote an entry saying, today mommy is on another trip with the president. When she is away, the house is dark. It is though she is dead. I said, that's it. You can never get your kids back. So I said, no, I, I, I'm done. I'm done with this time. I don't need to fly an Air Force on one anymore. I, it's time to move on to another job. And so at that time, you know, I was going to stay in Washington to work at GW University and do executive health. And out of the blue, answer a prayer, I get the Journal of the Medi Medi American Medical Association. I open up the page. There's a half-page ad for Mayo Clinic Scottsdale looking at me. Executive health program. I went, that's interesting. I know Scottsdale. I know Mayo. And, you know, my parents live in San Diego. And so I called up the people at Mayo Rochester. I said, hey, I know she got an opening in executive health in Scottsdale. What's that about? They said, oh yeah, you're, you're there with two other guys, great executive health, you do physicals. Well, why? I said, well, I'm going to retire from the Navy. They said, well, why don't you come here to Rochester? I said, I love you guys, but I don't do snow anymore. No, <laughs> snow. And they don't have good Mexican food like they do. So, so I said, let me go ahead and apply to a job in San Diego, in uh, Phoenix. So I came out, I interviewed in January, it was beautiful. Came out here, I spent uh, three and a half years at Mayo Clinic Scottsdale. There was a reason I was there. I met some good friends and I met the man I ultimately married nine years ago, nine years ago. So uh, your life goes on. You practice medicine, but you still have a life. Life continues. What did I learn from the White House that I applied to my daily practice? I set up a practice 14 years ago. It's up in North Scottsdale. I use this mantra and a lot of words as my business model. I have no business degree. My late husband was at Harvard every day. But I use the word letters and the word star. And you can apply it to a lot of things. If you focus on the star principle, it's really about delivering service, because we're in the service industry, right? It's about inspiring trust, your, your patients trust you. Access, everything's 24-7. You know, a lot of times it's not set hours. Your patients want to call you in the middle of the night. Relationship is huge. Relationship is premier. It's your relationship. Not only with your patients, but your colleagues, everybody out there. If you're running your business, it's your revenue. Really, you, you, want to, you don't want to go into business and be broke. You want to make money so you can pay your staff, you can invest, you can expand. And the final thing is your reputation. What do people say about you? What does the community say about you? What do your patients say? What's your reputation? I show this, and I love this picture. This is my late husband. Uh, he was a Harvard MBA, turnaround guy, CEO. He was my patient at Mayo for five years. He went through his divorce the second year I had met him. And then uh, when he was my patient the seventh year, I knew him. Is it seven years? Five years into me as his doctor. 
He came out for a physical. He found out I was going through divorce. He promptly proposed to marry me to my exam room after he was crossing. <laughs> I wore my KY job. So, but I lost him in July. He, uh, he died in 63 in a glider accident. So, um, but you got to believe him. He died doing what he loved to do, right? If you can all die doing what you love to do, so be it. And the other thing, too, and he had guns. Got, we, all our patients die, guys. I know we don't want it to happen. All our patients die. You will sign death certificates. You will be in the deathbeds of our patients. They all die. They all die. So how do you look at that? You know, how you deal with death? You will deal with death. You are healers. You're, you are, you're there is to optimize health, prevent illness, do no harm. But in the end, our patients die. So look at your spirituality. What, to, the thing that sustained me is my spirituality, my faith in God, he can, and my mediums. He's fine. He's happy. He's joyful. He looks out for me. I have an angel in heaven. But the lesson he teaches me, it's never too late to live happily ever after when it comes to your life, love, your love. I met him when I was in my late 40s. We didn't start dating until I was 53. I married him when I was 55, young bride of 55. And so it's never too late, right? Never too late to look at your relationships. You make sure you're your biggest fan. The other is the people around you. How do you know if people around you are good for you? They inspire you to be the best you can be. You know your true friends. Your two friends, when you're with them, you are the best you can be. So surround yourself with those. But even better, marry somebody like that. Voice of America, I, I, well, first of all, I don't have a picture of my book, but I published my memoir, The White House Doctor, My Patients for Presidents, in 2010, the year I got married, did a book tour. Uh, that book, interesting, the Lifestyle book, it's a memoir, got off to the CBS studios last summer. So stay tuned, I'm still waiting for them to do the television series. So that's the fun part. That's fun TV media stuff. I have a radio show on Voice America Network, and it's a monthly show, podcast. It's fun, it's great. I, I need to interview uh, some of your alumni in the show, talk about naturopathic medicine. Uh, radio shows are fun because it breaks your habit of saying odd ah, and like. <laughs> and nobody yells at you over the phone. Everyone's nice. You can talk about things. It's, and it has thousands of people listening. So I get to do that for fun. Let me talk briefly about presidential longevity because I think some of the things that apply to this apply to your patients. Presidents live longer than most people would, would care to admit. Why is that? They used to argue that because they're wealthy and educated, not necessarily. J.L. Shansky at University of Chicago did studies where he looked, he looked back at the history of presidents and looked at actuarials and looked at the age of men, similar to them who died, and presidents still outlive everybody. And I call them, why is that? There are 11 secrets, they all start with the letter P. Number one, they all have purpose. And you'll find if you read The Blue Zones by my dear friends in Minneapolis, every Longevity study shows you that people who make a long, long life are purposeful. I have a reason to get up every morning. I have things to do. Too busy. I'm, I'm just too busy to talk. They got things to do, right? They have purpose. Have a purpose. They have a partner. They're not, you know, loneliness kills people early, right? Surround yourself with your tribe, your people, your loved ones. You have to have that. Prosperity helps, right? It can also be detrimental, but if you have a certain level of prosperity, then you can afford medical care. You, you have access to care, you have access to medications. We have access. Physician, healer, naturopath, you have a medical advocate. You can call and say, no, in this chest pain, or my diet's not right, can you help me? They have access. Physical is they're physically active. Nobody's morbidly obese. They, they die soon, but they're physically active. P is portions. They don't eat a lot of big stuff. They have small portions. Almost all of them have pets, right? That's a plus. If you have it, why, is, why are pets good? Unconditional law. They give you a condition about when they get you up every morning, they'll walk my dog, walk my dog. They know how to play. And that's hard. I mean, for me as a workaholic, what what do you do for fun, right? And you have to ask yourself, what do you do for fun? You study, you go to school, but have something that's totally different from medicine that you do for fun. I have friends who are sculptors, they write music, they act. I mean, I have a friend who's a, a radiologist who uh, who was who's an actress on Star Trek. I mean, they do fun stuff. They do fun stuff. <laughs> Protection, don't do, don't do risky things. Don't get in the I mean, 
God bless my husband, he did for since he was 16, but that's not safe. My stepkids said, oh, we always thought it was safe. I said, listen, if you have to put on a parachute, that's a red flag that perhaps what you're doing may not be safe, right? Whoa. Hold that nuts of bully pulpit. What does that mean? Why do presidents live on because of the bully pulpit? Because they value what they say, right? You can practice law, I mean, as a physician. I mean, as long as your brain works, you're still current, as long as you are in tune with people, and you keep current, and you're you're still with it. You could do it a long time, right? So really, your bully pulpit is when you speak, people listen. When former presidents say something, everyone breaks up. What do former presidents say? Oh my gosh! And then have your wall of achievements. You know, they have a library. You should have your wall of your achievements and your diplomas, all your accolades. That's okay. You're not being narcissistic. You're just having healthy self love. That's okay. There's nothing wrong. The final thing is peace, right? We all lose our patience in the end to God. God wins, God wins. What am I doing with them in the meantime? So I alleviate suffering and I optimize their health, which is your job, right? But are you at peace with loss? How do you deal? And life, when you look at life, the only constant is change. It's always change, and it changes fast. So how are you acceptance of that? How do you deal with that is important. So it's all about healing. I love my natural pastor, I love that. I, I, I'm so enamored by your philosophy. Really, it's about having nature heal the body, right? Using forces of nature, what we have are gifted in nature to heal. Identifying causes of disease, how to prevent it. Obviously, we say the major tenet, do no harm. But you treat the whole person, it isn't just parts of it, the whole person, that's how. And you are, in a lot of ways, healers. You're not technicians, you're healers. You know technology, you know the science, but you're healing the human spirit and the being. And you're a teacher. Doctare in Latin is teacher. And you're always teaching your patients. You're always teaching. And then prevention beats cure all the time. If you can prevent it, you save their life. So what prescriptions would I hand to you? Number one, your purpose. And your purpose, you're, you're going to be a naturopath. You're going to, you're going to graduate, you're going to go out in the world, take care of people. But also separate is your calling. Is your calling meant to be a naturopath? You got a job, right? But really, where is your passion? Is it to write a book about, about homeopathy or being a naturopath? Is it to have children who go on to do other things? Is it to have be a counselor to certain people, advisors? Is it to invent something? Is it to create a medicine that helps so many people? What is my calling? Make better everybody you touch. Embrace optimism. We live in a negative world. And when people come to you, nobody comes to you because they feel great and they're happy, right? Why is everybody so unhappy when they come to you? Well, you're a doctor. I mean, they're gonna they're gonna come to you when they feel bad, not huh? because they feel great. They're not. You, you want them to feel great. So be positive, be optimistic. You know, even my patients, God forbid, you know, the sad thing is when I tell somebody that the prognosis is poor, I always give them some hope, right? Always have a plan. You know, if this is a terminal disease, we're gonna do everything we can, but also have, you know, in the end you say, we've, we've done everything we can. You know, you talk about accepting death, the final outcome, then offer them peace, offer them comfort. How can we help you with hospice? How can we help you? and then he's into that. And a lot of that is the therapy is your time spent with them. It's the words that aren't said, but just actually being with it. Being there for them is such a powerful medicine. Be deliberately kind. Not, if, not you know, when, when, when there was that thing that they say about, you know, haphazardly kind, but just be intentionally kind to every, random acts of kindness. Don't be random, just be intentionally kind to every single human being. That is such a powerful tool, especially in a negative world, that you're kind. Faith, family, friends are huge. Be grateful for everything, but take care of yourself. Those are important things. So with that, I'm going to end this so you can start your next class. If you have any questions, I'm going to be available afterwards in the cafeteria. But I want to thank you for listening in, and I wish you great success. Be a sponge. Have fun doing this, and go take care of all those patients. <laughs>